Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and this is episode 18, Boudicca and the Revolt Against the Romans. So, last time we talked a lot about the Silures. In fact, they were basically the entire episode. And the dominance that eventually happens when the Romans finally can negotiate a peace or in some way create a peace with them, which then creates the first stability that they have in Wales outside of likely the Pembrokeshire area, which, as I've said before, seemed to have been a peaceful area right from the get-go. As this occurs, one of the things that happens is we get a twofold situation. One, the Brigantes go into revolt. Uh, as I've said before, Cartamandua, the leader of the uh, Brigantes, had held them with the help of the Romans under sway for quite a while. But at this point, she starts to lose control because her hu- she divorces her husband, Ventius. Ventius, obviously not a huge fan of the Romans anyway, creates a revolt amongst the uh, Brigantes. And eventually this revolt is put down because... The- uh, Cartamandua flees to the Romans and gets help in dealing with them. And Cartamandua will do this twice because there's another incident with another ex-husband. And she, obviously, it's it's probably one of two things. One, the men are like, hey, we should be the ones in power. We know in the past that Iron Age Britain had w- female leaders. That wasn't uncommon. It wasn't like massively every leader was a female but they definitely had them. Now, the Romans will look down on them. In fact, they look down on Cartamandua, which I find hilarious, and kind of point out the fact that, by saying effectively that it's because she's a woman is the reason they revolt against her. The way the, the British tribes work and how they function from a standpoint of who's considered in charge. And I, I, I get the impression from historians and archaeologists that this isn't really the way it worked in Iron Age Britain. In Iron Age Britain, whoever was the leader was the leader, female, male, whatever. They were considered to be the most important person. And up until this point, Cartamandua has sort of run the Brigantes pretty much without fail. This is kind of the first sign that the Brigantes are not happy to be dealing with the Romans. My guess is, as part of the problem, is the Deca Angli, who exist in an area in northwest Wales. We've talked about them a little bit in the past in one of the episodes. They are a tribe that kind of ran the areas around Anglesey and the Llyn Peninsula and going into even as far as uh, Bangor and that area. So they're very much ingrained near the Brigantes. They're probably within trading distance easily. And so there was probably familial and kinship relationships. So the fact that the Deca Angli and the Brigantes are talking about revolting at one point says that there is a connection between the two that Cartamandua is not controlling and that she's having to go back and appeal to her client leadership uh, as a client king, queen in this case, uh, with the Romans to try and help her out. And the Romans do this. They, they do this in the Middle East and other places where if they have a client king and the client king says, hey, I need help taking back X location, the Romans will send troops to help out. In fact, the only time where they sort of become a problem, and we're going to see this current coming up, is when the Romans feel that the new king isn't really the one in charge anymore. And that's typically when they become a problem, and they will become a problem soon enough in Britain. So to get back to my point, so you have the Deca Angli who are causing trouble. You have the Brigantes who, the, like I said, the Romans had to go up and deal with to make them kind of fall back in line. They remain a client kingdom as long as Cartamandua is alive, and that will come to an end eventually, and they will fold into the Roman province of Britannia. However, two tribes that are causing problems in Wales, the Silurians were one. They've been dealt with. The other one had actually been the one that had helped uh, Cartacus fight against the Romans just a decade or so ago, and that's the Ordovis. The Ordovis are a tribe that predominantly controlled the areas around mid-eastern Wales up to just sort of south of Liverpool area. So they controlled quite a swath of territory. They were actually in league with the Dobani, who were an early Roman enemy. And so they had some associations and affiliations with groups who had opposed the Romans from the beginning. They remained a problem. In fact, the governor at the time, Polinius, 
decides that the only way to really deal with them is to finally go after the, who they consider to be the real problem children here, and that's the Druids. We have talked about before the Roman perception of what the Druids were from being sort of their own oracles and their own version of the Vestal Virgins, where they would appeal to them to understand the prophecies of the gods, you know, before they would do things. Uh, the propaganda from Rome said they were human sacrificers and that they were problematic because of this, that they were evil was obviously, I mean, uh, that's, that's your stock in trade when you're dealing with a foreign power, you know, you, you say, oh, look, they're evil. They do bad things. They, they have evil religious ideas. And so this is something that they use against the Britons to try and stop British resistance. And the biggest perception of British resistance at this point is the Druids. So as we've said before, the base of the Druids, the, the, the place where it seems was the center of knowledge for Druids, at least in Britain, possibly even for all of uh, Britain and Gaul, was the island of Anglesey, or Mons, as they called it at that point. They end up going after Anglesey and going after the Druids. And so Polinus takes troops from the legions, heads off into North Wales to try and bring these two tribes, the Deca Angli and the Ordovis, to heal. And in bringing them to heal, deal with the Druids. And they do a reasonably good job of that. They achieve fairly quickly. I mean, they start that attempt in 59 AD. By 61, they basically have it under control. They actually hit the island of Anglesey, and with the exception of Tacitus describes an incident where they hit the beaches. And again, Tacitus has this fascination with women are evil, and this seems to be pretty close to most Roman writings are that the only time you mention a woman is either she's immensely noble or she's completely disgusting and evil and, and, and the trouble behind the throne. In this case, he uses the example of they hit the beaches and all these people are dressed in black and they're using black magic against them and cursing them and calling down fire from the gods upon them and all this kind of stuff. So you get this image of this, these cloaked figures you know, hands waving in the air, calling the magic to come destroy the Roman troops. And if you're not experienced with this, if you haven't really dealt with the, the, the Druids to this point, I get the impression that after, especially after the original landings by Julius Caesar, so that when Claudius comes back, there's no mention in the sources about Druids being involved in the battles themselves. They may have been, but there's no real mention of them. You know, in, in Caesar's time, he mentions the fact that they, the women and the men, Druids, kind of bless the the military and, and give them the blue paint, the woad, to kind of gird them up. Because, of course, woad is supposed to be this hallucinogenic type thing, which gives them the power to take on the enemy. Uh, because, of course, you can't say that the other side is brave. Not easily, unless you're trying to make a point about the Romans being lacking in bravery. So which Caesar would never have done with his own troops. So you have this perspective, right? But that perspective ends when we get to Tacitus and Dio and uh, Suetonius. They don't mention the Druids in that respect. They mention all sorts of nasty things about the Druids. But to this point, they're not mentioned in the battles. Now they're mentioned. And like I said, now... Tacitus makes it sound like, well, they kind of stopped, they looked, they were scared for a minute, and then they move forward as good Romans do. That's what our troops do. They don't give up just because there's these people boogie-boogieing at them, literally. Uh, these barbarians can't do that to us. But the fact that he mentioned that they stopped, to me, says that there's probably more to that than what he's saying, that they were actually quite scared. Now, whether they were scared because these were women, because, as I said, Roman society is misogynistic. Because it's that way, it perceives women as lesser or perceives women in different roles than what the men are. So whenever you have a situation where there are women in a fighting role, be it even as sort of priestly role, that throws the Romans. And I think that was the case here. I don't think they knew what to make of this situation. But then you combine it with the fact that You'd have people that are superstitious. You're going to have people in the Roman military at this point who come from places like Gaul, who come from Germany, who come from other areas where cursing... And, and we know from the archaeological evidence 
that there was a number of curses that were given out through the Roman lifetime. Romans cursed everybody. <laughs> At some point, it seemed like it, it, you'd find graffiti on walls and all sorts of places and in, and in funeral areas cursing someone. Fairly famous one is of a gladiator cursing a referee for basically just screwing him over and that's why he died. So there's all this kind of stuff that goes on. So if you have somebody, especially someone who might have been a Gaul, who understands the language that's being spoken, because that was the other thing is, is that the Britons to this point and probably into the future continue to speak their own Celtic or origin language, which the Romans are at pains to say is the same or at least similar to the one in Gaul. And if it's Brythonic, which is probably an approximation of what it was, either Brythonic, which becomes Welsh, Cornish, Brittany languages. If it's that language, then you can see where that would throw them off. If it's Gaelic, because at that point it's before Latin kind of, because the big key with Brythonic is there's a lot of influence of Latin because of course Latin merges into that language so that when you come out of Roman Britain, the language that they're speaking has still got that influence of Latin in it. Because it was the lingua franca of the empire, you couldn't make trade, you couldn't talk to someone else from another country unless you spoke that language. So in all likelihood, anybody who went outside of their local community had to pick up some Latin and be able to at least carry on a basic conversation. Not really dissimilar to English. I mean, a lot of foreign countries these days... Even when you speak a particular language, you might still pick up English because while you might not be understood in your own language, be it Swedish or Russian or whatever, uh, you would be at least have a chance of being understood in English because English is so pervasive in the world culture right now. And to the point where, you know, it can be used in random points at times. And, and we use a lot of borrowed words, even, you know, Welsh uses a lot of borrowed English words, but many other countries across the world have borrowed English words because there isn't an equal comparison in other languages. And sometimes they work to try and create an equal to try and diversify themselves and yet still end up with this English word being used. I know in, in Quebec, where they speak a, a type of French Canadian, there is a tendency to have English words in the language, which if you went over to Paris, they wouldn't be called that. So that's one of the things that you would have happen. So if they were speaking Brythonic or if they were speaking a type of Gaelic, doesn't really matter. What does matter is, is that there's probably people who understood what was being said, were probably freaking out is my guess, <laughs> uh, and saying to the other Romans, guys, these guys are really nasty and they're saying really nasty stuff about us. And they're women too. And oh no, you know, and they're priests and oh my gosh, and they're scary and they commit. And probably what also didn't help was their, their own Roman propaganda. Because if you're scared of these guys, because you've been told, oh, they're human sacrifices. I mean, think of it like if you think about the old uh, Imperial Britain, when they would talk about going to the South Seas and they talked about cannibals in Africa and in the Southern Southern Ocean near Australia, this idea of a cannibal. Now, all of a sudden, everybody thinks, oh, if I go over to this island where there's all these islanders, they're going to eat me. And that whole concept pervades into the culture of the English speaking world, right to the point where cartoons still were bringing this up in the 20th century. So that kind of thing can put the fear of the gods in you, effectively. And you would be afraid of these people because if they caught you, you don't know what they're going to do to you. If they catch you and kill you and eat you, I mean, that's that's unnerving to our sensibility. And I'm sure it was to the Romans. They never did this kind of thing. So this propaganda in this particular occasion probably worked against them. And as I said, Tacitus talks about it like as if it was like a five second thing. They went, oh, shush, you know, what are we going to do? And then they went, OK, we're Romans. Let's go be Romans. And then went on. I'm suspicious that that's not necessarily the case because they had, took them a long time to deal with this. And they went out and punished the Druids. And you don't do that if they're giving in easily unless you're really going to make a point. So my theory is, is that 
they were probably scared spitless. The commanders probably got control over them before they revolted and effectively said, look, guys, we either take these guys on now or we take them on later, but we must take them on. And so then discipline overcame fear and then they moved on and then they attacked. And when the Romans attacked, there was no quarter given to the Druids, at least from the Roman descriptions. Now, we know that Druidism doesn't cease just because the Romans win here and obviously did do a great deal of damage to the Druidic faith in Britain. But we do know it doesn't cease to exist because there were still bards. There's still those kind of people that are in those positions. There's still the poetic people who take a very druidic position, even into Christian times, where they're kind of poetic, but they're also kind of prophetic. In the times even of, of Oen Glyndur, a thousand years later, actually almost 1,500 years later, there's still this idea of having a prophetic poet and bard with you who can tell the stories of your achievements in your life. So there is a level of druidic worship that maintains past this point. But like I said, with the Roman writers, it's always an all or nothing thing. You know, they don't lose battles <laughs> unless it's a big loss. They, you know, they always describe it like, well, we were down, but we weren't out and we came back and won. And they remind you a lot of the old World War II propaganda where nothing is completely a defeat, even when it's a total defeat. And they may have struggled here it would explain why what happens next is able to happen. And what happens next is the Iceni have been a client kingdom. They've had problems with the Romans, but for the most part, they've been a friend of Rome. And the latest king was a friend of Rome, so much so that he was a little worried about what the Romans would do once he passed away. But he tried to make sure to keep them on their good side by offering them a, mem a part of his will. So that when he passed away, there would be something given to the Romans, but most of the kingdom would remain with his family and his daughters. As we mentioned before, uh, the Romans are not well thought for females. They don't consider the daughters to be important. And so they take everything. Boudicca, the queen, protests and says, hey, you can't do this. And so they go in and cause trouble for her. The Roman uh, legion comes in. They, as the story goes, and Tacitus has a very well written out and somewhat probably apocryphal description of this whole thing, in which Boudicca is taken captive, all the daughters are taken captive, the daughters are raped in front of Boudicca, and it's just, you know, it's the kind of thing that that would outrage anybody, right? And I think that's kind of the point. I think if the Romans are looking for a reason why this revolt becomes so widespread, trying to give it a, a, a story touch, right? Like to give it a something to sort of say, here's the reason why, and it was because we were bad. Instead of, well, really, it might have been the entire cultural oppression of the British and maybe even rumors were spreading about the fact that they were going to kill the Druids that may have lit the final fuse. We don't know. All we have, again, as I've said many times, is one perspective. And that perspective is very much treat, talking to people who agreed with that perspective. And so I wish we knew more. I wish we had a good concept of what happened. We don't. We just have the, the Roman interpretations. They're still good. They're still important. And they're still relatively accurate in some respects. A lot of it you have to take with grains of salt. But considering what we now know archaeologically, this isn't completely incorrect or some sort of fabrication or something written so far beyond that point that we don't have evidence of it. In this case, we have a solid evidence. So what happens is, is the Isene revolt, but they aren't the only ones that revolt. It becomes actually a south... East England revolt, where the tribes in that area start to rise up at once. And it may be at this point when Nero basically says, what is the point in keeping this thing? Nobody knows for sure, because this does happen in the time of Nero. So it's before the Julio-Claudians exit the scene. 
it's still early days in the Roman rule in Britain. So there's still a lot of resentment and animosity towards the Roman way of doing things. And so you can understand that from a cultural standpoint, they came to the Iceni. They Iceni said, hey, we're going to be your friends. The Romans said, great, you're our friends. Then the Romans came back and said, now we want your weapons. Then the Romans come back and say, now we want your land. And they may have wanted it for a number of reasons, one of which, which we'll get to, is they may have been using it to create colonies. So if they want a colonia there, as we've mentioned before, they look for the best land, they steal the best land, they put older troops and former troops there because they act as militia should they be needed to stomp down anything that goes on. All of these things have gone on, and there's a lot of resentment surrounding this. And one of the places where a colony was first set up, and we've talked about before, is Colchester. And at this point in our story is where Boudicca, leading her revolt, finds the first big target of their ire, and the first big target is Colchester. And they burn the thing to the ground. And most of the citizens of Colchester flee into the Temple of Claudius, which we, again, brought up before, to try and save themselves from Boudicca, Boudicca burns the whole temple to the ground. Again, we're getting perspectives from the Romans, so understand that this may not have exactly happened the way it's described, but effectively what they're doing is pointing out that Boudicca gave no quarter to the Romans because she felt they gave no quarter to them and wouldn't give quarter to them. So thus, she destroyed them utterly, sent women and children fleeing into the woods, basically did everything she could to eliminate the Roman presence in her lands and surrounding area. After they took Colchester, word of this comes to Polinus. He then boots it back there with legions to try and fight them. But by the time he gets there, he's too late to stop them from taking Londinium, another new Civitas, better known to us today, of course, as London. Boudicca takes Londinium, now, the one thing I do question with Boudicca's wisdom here is if she holds that area, she has a, a, a an area that can protect her, she has a fort, she has things that can keep her from being easily attacked. She doesn't do that. She just tears it to the ground uh, and Londinium falls and falls completely. And we have evidence that, and going back to the archaeological evidence, we have evidence at Colchester at that point from a radiocarbon dating that there is a massive burn in Colchester. There's actually a lair, which they call the Boudican lair, because that's where the fire has left ash everywhere. So there is an acknowledgement that that's what's happened. And because we have a writer like Tacitus, who was actually alive during this particular event and probably knew a lot about it because of his father-in-law, Agricola, who's over there for some of this, you understand that they know what's going on. And Paulinus at this point is scared to confront Boudicca due to Boudicca's massive army she has. The Romans have a large legionary force, but one of them has basically been wiped out in trying to save Colchester. Another one has just been fighting with the Ordovis and the Deca Angli and then the Druids, so they're worn out. They appeal to the second Roman legion, the Augustan legion, which at this point is down near Exeter. The leader of the Ro of the legionary group decides that he's not going to get involved because he figures that his legion will just get wiped out as well. And so instead, because he doesn't get involved, he'll actually commit suicide later over it. In the end, the Romans are able to get control again. They They actually do what Romans do in so many occasions. They just don't give in. And they didn't give in to the Iron Age tribes that are now being Romanized and are revolting against this Romanization. They decide at that point, no, you're not going to take us. You're not going to beat us. So they find a place to have kind of a last stand almost. And they set it up in the best way they can. And as the story goes, they have woods at their back they are in a wedge formation. The troops of Boudicca's come into this and there's a massive troop horde, you know, many times over what the Romans had. And again, most historians and archaeologists doubt this. 
they think that the numbers are skewed quite dramatically to make for a dramatic story. But even still, there is an acknowledgement that they probably outnumbered the Romans. Thus, they would feel emboldened to take on a Roman legion, even though the Roman legion is better prepared and better trained. So they fight them. Now, again, here's another side effect. So if you know civil U.S. Civil War history, you know it, the Battle of Bull Run, one of the first battles of the war, it was still in an era when you kind of brought the family out to watch. Why you'd bring a family out to watch the war, I don't know. But anyway, and so there were sort of like family uh, carts and, and, thing, and coaches out on the side. And when the troops ran, they, these coaches had to make it for their, you know, hightail it out of there. Well, this is kind of what happens in this situation. The The story goes is that Boudicca had uh, women and children and everything at the back, probably as I suspect it's a supply train. They may have kept their families with them to try and protect them from Roman retaliation because, of course, the Romans are terrible for this kind of thing and they will retaliate and they will take it out on your family and anybody else to make sure you pay for it. That's the reason why they do some of the stuff that they do to other people. So they kept their family with them. The families are at the back. The other option could be is that the, the, the claiming a booty then becomes sort of a family affair after the battle's over. Any which way, this makes effectively a nice uh, picket line. And so when the Boudicca army attacks the Romans, the Romans squash them because they're disorganized. They're attacking, probably thinking, hey, we got these guys cornered. They're in a bad way. All we have to do is take them out. And they've been winning. And so they get emboldened by the winning. And so they think, well, we'll just take these guys out like we did the last ones. But these guys aren't caught out. They're, they're well-trained. They've been fighting the Welsh tribes for quite a while. And they know how to fight these guys. And they've got the protection. They've got the advantage of the terrain. They understand the terrain. And on this occasion they get exactly what they want, which is an open battle on the ground, person to person, with the Roman training going up against a disorganized British mass that isn't, again, going back to what we talked about last week, isn't contained in a unified military structure, but is rather a collection of tribes fighting side by side. So there's no coordination, there's no real control. You have chariots, you have foot soldiers, you have people on horses and they're all sort of raging and yeah if you are scared of them you'll run at the first sign of this trouble the romans don't as i said they've been trained they've, they've experienced the ways to fight the britons because they've been fighting them for 20 years at this point they hit them the romans hold their line holds and as long as their line holds they can move forward and you can't stop them and that was the problem they couldn't stop them. They couldn't punch through. They couldn't cause the chaos that they had caused before because of the terrain, because of the Roman understanding that if they didn't fight, again, going back to what we talked about with the Silurians last week, if you're telling me that I'm going to get wiped out if I don't fight, I'm going to fight. And I'm going to fight doggedly because this is, you know, it's either you or me. So it's going to be you, not me. And that's what he, they do. And they come out and they fight it out. And they beat them in part because the Britons aren't coordinated, but also because when the Britons start to pull back, they hit the wagon trains, they get picketed, basically, and they're almost pincered by the Romans and their own wagon trains, and they squash them. And that ends the revolt. It ends, really, the last sustained problem for the Romans in Britain. They will continue to fight Welsh tribes, they will eventually fight the Scottish tribes and the Picts in the north. But for now, and for quite pretty much the rest of the next 400 years, the major problems they're going to have in Roman Britain have come to an end. Because this is the last sustained revolt against Roman rule. The next revolt that happens in Britain is actually going to be because of Roman rule, not against Roman rule. As by this point, the Roman Britons have been incultured and now they're supporting an emperor candidate, but that's a couple of hundred years away. So Boudicca is sort of like the last kick of the British can against the Roman forces that's actually a serious threat and is actually the last time when we think the Romans could have been booted from the island up until 410 AD when they leave on their own. 
And at this point, we will start to now talk about the acculturation of Britain into the Roman Empire, the development of the Welsh areas into Roman areas, and what that means for those local tribes, for the communities, what, how that changes their cultural identity, how it changes how, after the Roman period, the perceptions of the people remain Roman for a while. Even into the time of Gildas, where we're talking the 6th century, where there's still talk about people being Roman nobles and not necessarily Britons. And the identity of people is still associated with the old Roman empires. And it's actually just a continuation for some people in that era. And so we'll talk about that more next time and we'll go on about this. And just to conclude, I just want to say thank you very much for listening to this series. I hope you're getting something out of it. Any comments, suggestions, concerns, you can reach me at uh, the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at Welsh History Pod, or you can contact me on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And I will try and answer anything I do know or do understand. I will tell you that sometimes I don't have a clue based on I don't know everything about what goes on in Welsh history. And if I don't, I'll go look it up and, and try and at least give you an educated comment. Or if you have suggestions, I would love those too. So please don't hesitate to contact me. And thank you very much. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.